Make Real specializes in creating immersive learning solutions across a range of technologies. To download their latest academic paper on how to turn learners into activists, visit makereal.co.uk slash activists. Did you ever have that experience of paging through a piece of learning content going, yes, know that, know that already, everybody knows that, do they think we're idiots? Well, if my guest this time gets his way, you might never have to do that again. Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Hellman. Now guess what? Learning is learning cool. Is cool. cool. Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Learning. I'm learning. Learning is fun. And knowledge is power. Knowledge. Education. Adaptive learning has been bubbling under for a while in learning technologies, but it's never quite broken through. That might be about to change. It's an inevitable result of the move to digital that we no longer necessarily learn in groups or cohorts. Digital learning can be far more personalised to each learner, but it's like we've had to wait for the technology and the understanding of practitioners to catch up. My guest this time is here to tell us how that catch up is doing. Kate Fitzgerald, Head of Facts, who is he? Hack facts. Andy Willer is Senior Vice President, Product Management at Area 9 Lyceum. He has 20 years experience in the world of learning technologies. Prior to joining Area 9, he served as a learning strategist for Hitachi Vantara, worked vendor side with Kineo and had senior positions with Legal and General and Royal Sun Alliance. Andy is also musical director of the Brighton and Hove City Brass Band here on the South Coast, where the hack team is based, but regrettably supports West Ham. So, Jay Curtis, head of themes. What themes emerged? What did we talk about? If only you could just be nice to people and just get them to tell you about their lovely products, John. I'm sure you could get these podcasts over a lot quicker. But no, you have to zoom in on the problem areas, don't you? Which were? Well, in this case, how specialist systems like Andy's fit in with the big learning suites that now dominate the market, and whether the sort of hyper-personalisation that adaptive systems represent really helps organisations develop. Your last guest, Nigel Payne, seemed to cast doubt on that point. I serve the listening public, Jay. I just ask the questions they need to have asked. Andy, welcome to The Learning Hack. Thank you very much, John. It's great to be here. You are SVP, Senior Vice President, as well as Product Management at Area 9 Lyceum. So tell us please about the product or products you manage. What do they do and how do they make the working lives of learning professionals easier? or at least maybe more productive? That's a great question with a lot of uh, things to cover in it. But uh, the first thing I think I'd mention is that my role at Area 9 is all about helping our corporate clients integrate those products into their existing ecosystems. And in sort of over 20 years of being in in learning technology, um, it's one, one thing that has always struck me is that most vendors don't have people who've actually been there and done it on the other side of the fence. Um, and so having a role within the product management team that enables me to get involved in, in helping all of our large clients um, make the best use of, of the products that we have and how best to integrate that into how corporates work within the ecosystems. And I'm not just talking about learning ecosystems. It goes much wider than that. You know, we have to be cognizant of the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of organisations um, have mandated that they that their staff will use teams. We have to think about what sorts of um, you know, business um, intelligence tools they're using uh, when they want us to, to work in those sort of areas. So it goes beyond learning platforms. It's about having that understanding of having been there and done it that enables uh, us to, to help clients better to use our, our products within, within their organisation. Um, so that, that's part of it. Um, as to what the products do, so it's an adaptive learning platform. I know we're going to come on to that later as to what that is. Um, but adaptive learning sort of uh, c- cuts training time in half whilst creating higher proficiency and uncovering 
and fixing unconscious incompetence. So some typical use cases for that might be, you know, when an adaptive approach is great when time off the job is expensive, as an example, or when outcomes have consequences. Um, when you need more evidence, and this is becoming much, much more the case now in the compliance world where bums on seats analytics is not enough. It's not enough to prove that people took the course. We need to be able to understand and prove, well, the quality of the course. You know, are the questions right? Are you know, it, it, are people learning from this stuff and are they getting to mastery and are we keeping them there? So that's become a, an area where adaptive learning thrives for us. Is it worth explaining for the people who are kind of new to the area or don't understand exactly what, what an adaptive system does that a, a normal piece of content wouldn't? Sure. Um, unfortunately, adaptive learning isn't really a well-defined term and the term is used by different people and different organisations to mean different things. Um, so when many vendors talk about personalisation or adaptivity, they're typically meaning curriculum adaptivity. So choosing which courses to assign to somebody based on metadata from an HR system, for example. Um, mm. However, the real value of adapting learning comes not at the curriculum level, but within the individual programmes themselves. So what's the next best step for this individual learner or what's the best way to help the learner with the task that they're um, in at that any given time. And the, the product that we have um, adapts based on exactly what is going on. So every single learner's journey is totally different. Okay, so to put it simply, you, you don't have to kind of sit through a load of content being presented to you that you already know. And people who've done face-to-face -face training courses will be very... Uh, We'll, we'll, we'll have had that happen to them. They'd have sat in a training room for half an hour, mm -hmm. the trainer drones on, telling them stuff that they know already, and they, they get fed up. Adaptive systems, short circuit that. They don't give you stuff you already know. Absolutely. I mean, we always used to say this in the old days of classroom training, you know, why send them on a week's course when the bit they need is on Wednesday afternoon? Um, mm. So, yes, the, 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 the adaptive uh, tools enable us to to check out your current understanding at a very granular level, you know, learning objective based level. And if it's clear that you understand it um, through your answers, through the amount of time it takes you to answer, through through the metacognition data that we collect, you know, uh, I'm sure, I'm not sure, I don't know, and that kind of stuff. Um, and that helps to determine through the AI behind the tool what happens next. So that's why everybody's path is totally different through the content. So the first question um, you always have to ask people with adaptive learning systems, I don't experience, is how adaptive is it? For example, at the simple end of things, I've seen content called adaptive when it starts with a quiz that sends learners off down one of only two different linear routes. And they say, oh, you know, change completely adaptive. At the other end of that spectrum, um, as far as complexity goes, there are systems that claim to update the page you're on in real time based on how you interact with with, with, with that content without well, kind of it doesn't just rearrange the pages but the the actual experience is completely different on the on the page that you're on and whether it actually works like that or not so whereabouts does your system sit on that spectrum and what's your more general take on adaptive learning um, you know in other words it, it, it's kind of the same question what's, yeah. what's the product what is the product what does it do but can you situate it situate it within that spectrum of complexity. Absolutely, and I, I think it's <clears throat> we are at that uh, very advanced sort of end of the spectrum there, so that um, we don't start with a huge, great, you know, summative test and then determine your path through the content. Um, so you, you are quizzed on what uh, we call them probes, but they are probing questions and extremely well written um, that are designed to understand whether or not you do know that particular learning objective. Um, if you don't know it, or if you're not sure, um, then what happens next is determined by the AI behind the platform. Um, so, uh, I mean, typically, um, in, if anybody's ever seen any of our marketing material, um, you can look at three different learners, all of whom get to 100% mastery. Each one takes a different length of time to get there, and each one has a totally different path through the content. So if you get something 
uh, wrong and, and you do it very quickly, for example, you know, you, you answer the question wrong, say, I know this, then that's perhaps slightly, a slightly different sort of position to you get it wrong, it took you a little bit of thinking time, you said, I'm not quite so sure about this. The, the, the former is the more dangerous, isn't it? The unconscious incompetence within the organisation. Um, mm. And I certainly wouldn't want to have my heart operated on by a doctor who has a high level of um, unconscious incompetence. Um, so yes, we're at that far end, but then we've been doing it for 25 years. Area 9 was one of the pioneers in this space. But I think, I mean, to the point that the other part of the, the question you, you were heading towards there is really um, adaptive has been around a long time, but it's yeah. only in the last <clears throat> probably two years that people are now starting to have an understanding, albeit not necessarily the same as ours, um, as to what it means. And I think that's been very much helped by the emergence of competition in, in this market space. There are other vendors now. Um, when I first used Adaptive um, as a client, uh, when I was at Hitachi, um, mm. it, nobody knew what Adaptive was. Um, Area 9 was the, <clears throat> was, the, was the main company doing this kind of stuff. <clears throat> and if you're having a conversation out there, you know, uh, customers don't have any comparisons to make. They didn't know what Adaptive was. They didn't know of any other vendors. <clears throat> so I think the emergence of competition in this space has been good for all of us because it's opened up the debate. Um, and if you look at um, any of the, the, the major sort of speakers on this topic, they're all talking about it. You know, we've done a number of uh, sort of fireside chats with Donald Taylor, for example. Um, um, uh, Nigel Payne has also interviewed our CEO as well. And of course, we've, we've, Fosway are much talking much more about adaptive now <clears throat> than they ever were before. So I think the emergence of competition has helped all of us. So absolutely welcome that and what are the blockers that it still has to overcome um lack of investment understanding adoption you're saying that there's more competition in the market perhaps that's an indication that there's more investment mm -hmm. in the space i know a few years ago um of, of at least one company uh, that decided to focus completely on the u.s market because there was a lot of a, uh, a lot of investment coming in from people like bill gates into the area and almost nothing over here so which of those things does it still need to overcome? Understanding, investment, adoption, at least as far as Area 9 is concerned? That's an interesting one. I think the adoption um, and the understanding that actually adaptive is not the same as the mind-blowingly dumb stuff that we've all been generating for the last 20 years. Um, and I'd include myself <laughs> in that. That's it's quite a mere culture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've all done it. We've all been there. I mean, in the early days of this, we didn't have anything else. Um, and then along came the, the whole rapid content creation tools um, that helped corporations to build more e-learning content at a lower cost than going out to the bespoke content houses. So we effectively dumbed ourselves down a bit, I think, by the adoption of some of these tools. Um, and we got to a position where it's, um, you know, here's, here's the problem we're trying to solve, if it's been properly identified. You've got a 45-minute um, e-learning experience to solve that. Off you go. Well, life's not like that. That's not, that's not necessarily how we're going to solve those business problems. Um, and I think that um, if you go through an adaptive experience and you are actually extremely knowledgeable on the subject and very consciously competent, you might look at the, the course and say, well, that wasn't engaging. And I'm, I'm, that, I'm great with that. That's absolutely fine because we're proving the point. You didn't need to go through some huge multimedia experience to be asked questions that perhaps weren't well written to then go through a summative test at the end just to mark the tick the box. So actually, mm. so yeah, this conception that um, <clears throat> If you, if you do know the topic extremely well, I wouldn't expect you to, to say that an adaptive learning course was particularly engaging in the way that watching some studio production video would have been engaging. But the question is, is did it need to be? Have we been wasting your time um, teaching you stuff you already know? I'm sort of taking from that answer that the, in, in terms of seeing what the, the, the blockers are to adoption and so on that perhaps it is 
in the stuff itself, in the way that it's designed, in the understanding of the people who produce it. In other words, you know, we are getting better and better at actually doing this to a point where it is more likely likely to be invested in and ad- ad- adopted. So uh, the question arises for me from that: um, what part has AI played? You know, AI has come on leaps and bounds in terms of um, its adoption within learning over the, the, the last few years. Has AI played? A significant part in this role? Well, the, the, obviously, the AI sits behind the whole um, adaptive algorithms that drive um, how the, the application works. But there is also AI in the content creation element, too. So we can take existing content um, and use some content robots to quickly transform that um, into an adaptive experience. So um, the conversion of existing content uh, can benefit from AI uh, in that respect for us as well. But it, it's, I mean, AI is everywhere, isn't it? Um, yeah. And, and, and certainly, I think that, that, that another thing that's worth mentioning is um, we actually do certify everybody who creates content on the platform. You know, we've got okay. 25 years worth of uh, experience in this, billions of data points over that period of time. Um, and we obviously w- would like to ensure that any content that goes on the platform is good content, well designed, well created, uh, and is going to achieve the results. So we, we put all of these, what we call learning engineers, through a certification program to achieve that. Um, and one of the th- that's another big difference, I think, certainly from my own experience in, in recent organisations, is the people building this content are, are being given all the tools they need to write laser-focused learning objectives, to write probing questions that don't have the obvious answer in there, all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> and then through to the actual content that will remediate, if it's necessary, it can be anything you like. Yes, that could link out to some multi million dollar video production but it could equally go out to to an AR um, or a VR solution to simulators we do a lot of work in the medical world um, and simulators play a big part in that of course mm. so it's a what the- it's it, I think it's for me it's it is a much better way of creating content and I've managed content teams in past organizations and I think it's fair to say if you <laughs> I'm sure anybody listening in here will have a team where if you go to Fred, you know it's going to be a video. If you go to Jim, you know it's going to be a, an articulate rise. If you go to, to, to Dave, it's going to be a three-day classroom event. Um, and I think that that's certainly uh, an adaptive course is designed much more efficiently to be effective and you're not going to land up pre-deciding what the outcome is, because you're building a learning, a learning resource to match each learning objective. And so for one particular objective, it may well be that we simply present a slideshow. For another one, it might be that you go out to, to some kind of simulation. Or for others, it might be group-based work, so an activity-based sort of um, thing that you have to do. So it's, it's, it's not predetermining the outcome, which I think rapid content tools in some ways actually do by the very nature of what they are. In the struggle against the forgetting curve that learning people are engaged in every day, there are no magic formulas, but there is science. For well over a century, psychologists have known that the spacing effect unlocks deep learning and helps learners power through to peak performance. And yet who uses it? Despite the fact that modern learning systems like LXPs make it almost easy, I've written a white paper with Learning Pool that shows how you can use the spacing effect to beat the forgetting curve. Download it now. The Learning Hack podcast is supported by Learning News, the learning sector's newswire. Rob and his team are good friends of the podcast and we really value the help and advice we've had from them and they do a great job. For the very latest news from around the learning sector, for interviews with learning leaders, the latest from learning sector vendors and features on workplace learning, go to learningnews.com. You're pointing up a lot of differences between what you do and 
what generally happens in the industry. You know, you know the majority mm -hmm. of content in the industry kind of floats free of a system, if you like. Um, adaptive seems to rely, at least in, in the way that you do it, relies on a complete integrated learning system um, for delivery design and so on. In a way, it's a descendant of the mechanical teaching machines of the last century, pioneered by Skinner and Sidney Pressey. People who listen to our sister podcast, Great Minds on Learning, plug, plug, will have heard all about that. However, the learn tech environment now is about ecosystems, uh, by and large, it's about ecosystems of different products connected with APIs, um, in some cases quite loosely related, and learning content by and large is pla platform agnostic, um, and it's made by different companies from the people who make the systems. So they, they're almost two different industry sectors in a way, content and platform, although a lot of people do both. I think the point I'm making here is that content is a bit plug and play on platform, if you want to put it that way. Um, your system isn't like that. More, more specialist systems such as yours, and I know Fosway classifies mm -hmm. you as a specialist system, tend to have to fit in with the majority vision of the world, which is about separating um, you know, I, I'm conscious of the fact that there's a lot of diversity in the market. What I'm saying here is slightly crude binary, but nonetheless, I think in this instance, it's worth thinking about. Uh, guys like you have to fit in with the vision of the world where, where content and platform are separate. And also with the big suites that dominate the market, a lot of those with kind of, you know, links into talent systems and so on. Are you swimming against the tide? Well, I, I would <clears throat> just come back with a question for you. Do you think Percipio is swimming against the tide? Do you think LinkedIn Learning is swimming against the tide? The content sits on their applications and, and is delivered out as federated content. So uh, I, I, I don't think we are. Um, most of our major corporate clients have those other applications and we work with a number of um, of the main LMS providers, for example. So we're working with a major bank at the moment. They have degreed, they have some total, you know, they've got this, they've got that. Um, and it's not necessarily a challenge from the content perspective to put our content in there. Uh, we can deliver that using SCORM, we have LTI. Um, we've got people using it within Microsoft Teams. You know, and, and we all thought, you know, Microsoft will never dominate the education market, but because Teams is and is everywhere, everybody has Teams. Um, if you're in a big organisation and you try to get another collaborative tool in from a learning vendor, don't bother if they if they've if they've already said Teams is what we're using. That's what you have to do. Uh, and we work very well with all of those. Um, it's not a, a particular big issue for us. It, the fact that the learning application sits on an external platform is not a, it doesn't have to be a blocker. Um, and it isn't for any of our clients. You know, we use, at its simplest form, uh, a SCORM-based integration um, works with, with actually no integration, really, apart from SCORM itself. Because SCORM is not an integration, it's an interoperability standard. So. Um, it can be as simple or as complex as it needs to be, and, and uh, we work with our larger clients to, to make that happen. And that's part, part of the area I work in a lot, is, is understanding what it is that corporates need, and sometimes what they think they need, and uh, counter that with what we think we've heard from them, and actually get to a, a position where we, we both understand exactly what's required and we make it happen. So looking at the supply side of uh, the, the, the content, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak, how easy or difficult is it to develop content for, for, for your system? Can um, instructional designers or learning designers within uh, client organisations develop the content? Or are, are these learning engineers you talk about, do they all have to work for you? No, absolutely not. There's a, there's a lot of options out there, actually. Uh, some some organisations... Um, will um, train up their own learning engineers, go through our certified program. Others use a partner, so we have a number of uh, partner organisations, uh, the usual suspects who have learning engineers who then create on behalf of their customers. Um, and we also have a number of partners who are creating specialised content and selling it using our platform. So. So, for example, in the sort of health and safety world, Rely on New Tech is a very big provider out there. Uh, they are repurposing all of their courseware into Adaptive, 
um, and making that available to their customers. So in that sense, you know, the, the, the creation of the content is separate from our platform because it's being done by a specialist partner. And that, uh, we see quite a bit of that going on. So, yeah, there are lots of ways of uh, doing it. It's not a barrier, the fact that we like people to be certified, um, because yeah. you can access them either through us as well, if necessary. We do have learning engineers um, based around the world, and, and we can also create content as well. So lots of options. Do it yourself. We do it for you. Get a partner to do it. Buy it from one of our partners who's already made it adaptive. What that's making me think is if we're to, to kind of look forward and a bit more generally about this, let's say that uh, adaptive systems begin to take over the world in terms of how people think about how learning content should be. Is this going to change the skill set? I, I noticed there's an interesting kind of difference, if you like, of uh, nomenclature there. You're talking about learning engineers. We used to talk about learning designers. Um, learning designers, many of them from creative backgrounds who love mm -hmm. to create big kind of uh, multimedia, rich media um, experiences and perhaps a kind of um, uh, movie makers monke, if you like. Is this trend, if it's a trend that, that, that becomes mainstream, um, going to change the skill set of learning designers? Are they going to have to transition to being learning engineers? I think that if, if you look at the the curriculum that we put our people through, we called it Area 9U. Um, there are a lot of uh, elements to that that perhaps previously were done by different teams. Um, so um, if you think back to, to the early days, you'd have teams of graphic designers, you'd have a video production team, you'd have an instructional designer, um, you'd have this, you'd have that, all working separately and working together, then bringing that together to create the end result. Um, the learning engineer is starting from the point of understanding, well, what's the business problem we're trying to solve? What are the skills you need to solve that problem? And therefore, what are the learning objectives that we need to get people to mastery of? Um, which is a, a very good starting point for any course. Um, I don't know how many internal teams using rapid content tools do that in the same way because they have this mentality of uh, as we, I've done myself 45 minutes to get through this topic with a summative test at the end um, so we're just yeah. starting from a different um, different perspective really um, <clears throat> so the learning engineer needs to be able to to identify what a good learning objective is and to write them and to write them appropriate to the level they need to be. So, you know, even things like having Bloom's taxonomy available to you when you're writing a learning objective within the application is a pretty neat thing to do. Um, and then be able to write probing questions based on those learning objectives um, within the application. So we, we don't pass it off to a separate team who have the specialism in um, articulate products, for example which is very often the case in an internal team. Some of the learning, the, the instructional designer will design the thing and somebody else will then build it in the tool. So to a degree, you're, you're getting a lot more expertise being done within the tool um, <clears throat> by the same person who wrote a lot of the, uh, the, the, the initial content in conjunction with a subject matter expert. So that was a very long-winded answer to the question that if you're going to use adaptive learning yes it is a different skill set it doesn't mean that the people designing um, those those multimedia elements are out of a job no not at all because there is a third element to this um, with the sort of triangle of things that goes on in rap science. so you've got the learning objective you've got the probing question then you have the learning resource that's going to remediate that um, so there is still the need for people who know how to create um, videos based on the, the sort of content they've been given or to create some kind of interactive thing or people who have experience with AR or VR tools, etc, etc. Th those don't go away. Mm -hmm. um, and very often they may or may not be in-house. I mean, certainly anything to do with VR is most likely not to be in-house. Um, mm -hmm. Or if you're looking at interactive video, for example, where you know, you want moving hotspots on video, stuff like that. There are specialist firms out there that do that extremely well. So mm. you're not going to invest in that in your in-house team. Um, but so, so yes, the, the, I think there's a fundamental difference in 
in, at the starting point of creating the learning. Uh, some of those other things still carry on. And of course, new skills will emerge as new technologies emerge uh, that can be used in learning. You mentioned Bloom there. I, I, it, it seems the answer is yes, but it, you know, it, it's we're adding something. We're not necessarily wiping skills out. No, and correct. it may be that what we're adding is a bit more science to the art, as it were. Yeah, it's a lot of, there's a lot of learning science sat behind the application that uh, would probably be the okay. subject of a whole other interview. But, uh, um, yeah, yeah, I mentioned yep. Bloom as, as just one example of something that maybe some people designing a, a rapid course may have forgotten about, or it may, you know, the, the aid memoirs perhaps sat in their desk and didn't come out. And of course, we, we during the process, the AI also, you know, is is reviewing the content that's created to to look at things like, well, what's the readability standard of this? You know, you've written something here that you need to be a graduate to understand, yet the audience is actually much lower down than that. So you need to do some work on that. Um, and there's loads of workflows built in for uh, approval, and even the learner can feedback. Uh, mm -hmm. During the course, so if a learner comes back and says, no, you've got that totally wrong. <laughs> Um, that goes back to the, the learning engineer who created the course and they get the opportunity to look at that and say, hmm, actually, John, you're right. That is wrong. We correct it now. And then it's immediately corrected for uh, every future student without having to republish the course. So, yeah, they, they, all of that stuff is built into it. That <clears throat> there are, They exist, obviously, in existing teams, but in different silos of different places. And, um, <laughs> and I think what we're doing is smartening up that that part of the uh, the process is it going to go mainstream to the point you made no of course it's not because um adaptive will never be a hundred percent of what's going on out there um and i'm sure the, the the rapid content providers and the content houses who are listening to this will be would be the first to say no no we're, we're, we're not scared by this this is just another part of uh, of the whole learning ecosystem some of them may choose to say, well, actually, let's have a look at this tool. Uh, maybe we could use this for some of our clients. And we, we do have some content partners who, who have done that. You mentioned Nigel Payne, Dr. Nigel Payne earlier. Um, I interviewed Nigel recently, <coughs> uh, just this week, actually, and he pointed out for the Learning Hack podcast, and he pointed out one drawback of the drive to greater personalization of learning, which Adaptive is part of. He believes an exclusive focus on the individual mm -hmm. prevents company building a true learning culture and a learning organization. We all learn together, uh, Nigel says, not in isolation. How would you respond to that concern, given that your system's very much about an intense personalization of learning? Okay, well, firstly, Nigel is a personal friend, um, very smart guy fellow West Ham supporter, so he must be. Um, <laughs> and uh, to, to, I think to that point, uh, adaptive learning is at the heart of what we do, but it's not the only tool we've got in the box. Um, we do have some of the activities uh, within the platform allow you to create things for people to do as a group. So you can create projects that involve people working together, coming up with some kind of uh, answer, you know, not dissimilar to the way the Open University um, was working in the o early days of, um, of when they embraced online stuff. So having s cohorts of students working together in an online environment backed up by integration into Zoom or whatever it happens to be, um, you know, with, with uh, collaboration um, rooms that they can use and giving them tasks to go off and work as a team. We have all of that. You know, the background to the, the, the product today um, goes back to a long period of time when Area 9 was very tightly aligned to McGraw-Hill education. Um, and as a result, I've talk, talked a lot about the corporate world, but of course we are extremely in, well embedded into the world of uh, education as well, where of course group work is is the starting point for a lot of things. So I, I, I'm not concerned by what Nigel says, and he's absolutely right to say what, what that. Um, it's not a concern of ours because we have that within the platform as well. I just haven't spoken much about that because that part isn't specifically adaptive per se, getting people to work together, but it, it's absolutely there. Wouldn't disagree with him. Andy, 
time is uh, our enemy, of course, as always on uh, podcasts where you want to keep things to a reasonable length so that people can fold their laundry or whatever <laughs> they do um, and, and won't miss it all. Uh, I feel we shouldn't pass out the chance to talk a little about your really interesting career in learning technology. I mean, you mentioned earlier, for instance, that you, you actually used this technology as, uh, as a buyer mm -hmm. um, before you moved over to the, um, to the vendor side. Uh, and there, there's an awful lot in your CV that I think is interesting. You know, you, 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 you have a military background. Uh, you have a big musical area to your activities as well, um, as do I, although you're one of those people who knows what the dots mean, and I don't. Can you tell us how you came to work in this field of learning and learning technology and maybe sum up your career path for us? Sure, absolutely. Um, it's interesting you mentioned music because um, whilst you most people wouldn't immediately draw a, a, a connection between that and the world of learning. What I do is actually very intimately connected. Um, there's a couple of things. I mean, I was always going to be a professional musician, but school came too early in my life, about 20 years too early. Uh, and I landed up in, in the British Army as a musician. Um, and I've been a semi-professional musician ever since, but my focus certainly for the last 25 years has been training musicians, brass musicians in particular, so I'm a, as a conductor trainer. Um, and it's very two interesting aspects of that that sort of lead to, to what I do today is the first one is training 25 people every Monday night who don't have to be there. It's a very, very uh, interesting um, sort of thing to do because you have to make sure that um, you're engaging them, you have to make sure that you're making progress that they can see. Um, um, otherwise they won't come back um, and also the other part of this is uh, as a musician there are, there are two, two, two ways of looking at this you practice uh, professional practices till they can't get it wrong and amateur practices till they get it right um, and, and both of those things have always been in the back of my mind um, as I lurched into this area um, following um, a, a period of working in mainframe IT as a, as a business um, uh, process manager, ch ch change requests and that kind of stuff. I'd been in the insurance business prior to that. Uh, I have been a product manager for an insurance product launch and uh, <clears throat> my boss at the time offered me the opportunity to do an MBA with the Open University. He says, we'll pay for it but you have to put the time in. Um, best thing I ever did. And one of the elective modules on there was knowledge management. And it struck me whilst doing that, that knowledge management and e-learning, um, you know, they are like Siamese twins who were separated at birth, uh, but, but that slowly coming back together. You know, knowledge management went off and became an IT systems problem. Learning obviously is a people problem, but um, actually knowledge management is a people problem. And, and, you know, I've written blog posts on that over the years as well. Um, at the same time, um, and this is roughly 23, 24 years ago, uh, my first organisation uh, gave me a position in e-learning. So this is right at the early days of e-learning, using tools like Lotus Learning Space version mm -hmm. 1, which wasn't even SCORM compliant, um, and testing out, well, what, what is this thing called e-learning? Um, can we use it? Um, so that was a great piece of work to be going from a, you know, a, a greenfield site through testing out does this stuff work to selecting a vendor to work with and to launching. Um, and then finally to transitioning to a new platform uh, when the, that part of the business was uh, outsourced uh, later on. Um, so during that period, I, I had managed or been involved in as program manager the whole cycle from, you know, uh, <clears throat> involved in the content creation, not doing it hands on at that stage uh, through vendor selection and eventually migration out to somebody else and um, and then redundancy. Um, and that led me then to, to the next company, which was Legal in General, who already had an LMS uh, that um, wasn't uh, launched at that time, they had a few problems with it, and so that gave me the opportunity then to, to once again purchase and deploy an LMS and saw that through to, to full use. 
did too good a job on that and they gave me the HR and payroll to manage at the same time towards the end and nobody wakes up in the morning wanting to do that, trust me. <laughs> so um, that led me then to um, another of the things that associate us sort of remotely, uh, music does of course, um, is uh, meeting Steve Rayson and I spent then uh, yeah. four months, or five months at Kineo. This was, this was my first venture onto the uh, vendor side, or as we used to call it, the dark side. Um, and I must admit, uh, the whole sort of ethos of how Kineo was working, uh, I loved it. Steve, Steve's a really smart guy, one of the smartest guys I've worked with. Um, and um, had a fun time there, working on, in a similar way, trying to help them understand how Tatara could work in the corporate space better than the way it was at that time. Um, part of the way through that, my network came calling, offered me more money, and I landed up at Itachi, which is uh, where I spent eight wonderful years. Um, towards the end of that, we started to, to look at um, adaptive learning. My then boss became the chief learning officer here at um, Area 9 until he retired, um, interestingly. And to, to give you a measure of how, how good that team was, day one, I attended, uh, of joining them, I attended a global gathering of the whole team um, and the, the sort of opening speaker for the day was Bob Mosher. Uh, that told me that, you know, this team are not messing about here. Um, you know, they're looking to, to, to do some, something different. And that led that, that particular thing up around, you know, the, the whole performance support piece, moments of need and everything, to project Timberlake um, thanks to Nick Howe for that one because it was just in time just enough and just for me so lots of Justins in there <laughs> um, and one of the outcomes of that was to get involved as Area 9's first corporate really big corporate customer so we deployed adaptive learning at Itachi Data Systems um, and by this time you know I've, got, I've gained so much experience of working in that whole space around different platforms you know including managing the hr payroll performance management pieces as well I've a very very holistic view that is not often seen um and certainly not in vendors but then um i i my role changed to they called me a strategist because i think uh, the new vp recognized that actually i've got a lot of stuff there that um, they're not utilizing which was great, but sadly, with that in your job title, when reorganisations come around, you're vulnerable. And mm. that led me to um, to being released by the organisation right at the time COVID started, which mm. is poor planning. So that was another period in my mm. life when I would have become a professional musician again, which is what I always do in between jobs. Um, but of course, we weren't gigging either. so. So that was a very interesting year. Um, and it was purely um, following a networking call um, that um, with my, my current boss here at Area 9 that I landed up here. Um, and I have to say, this, this is a, a fabulous organization. And I, I said Steve Rayson was one of the brightest guys I know. Um, our CEO here, uh, Ulrich, is if equally, if not more so, one of the smartest guys I know, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, and in this area of adaptive learning, um, I don't know of anybody who knows more than him. Um, so check out some of those uh, interviews he's done, the one with Nigel Payne or the ones with um, Donald Taylor. Uh, fascinating guy to listen to. Um, and as a, I, think, I think probably I, I've... I've run the time down here, but um, that's what's got me to where I am today. And, and at my advanced years now, uh, this will be, you know, my last permanent role, um, having got my bus pass last week. <laughs> so, Congratulations. Uh, not, that I'm, not that I'm uh, planning on retiring anytime soon, because I love what I'm doing. And, you know, I believe in the product that we've got and what we can do with it and how it can help corporates. Um, and long may that continue. I've been trying to keep count of the number of previous Learning Hack guests that you've mentioned, because I, I think, you know, you're talking about smart people that validates our choices of um, interviewees, about four or five, I think, mm -hmm. but um, I, I'm not really good at counting. 
Well, this is interesting you mention that because the um, a lot of the people I I know today I met through networking very early on. Networking's been, always been an extremely important part of my career development because you learn from people uh, as much as you do from books um, and a lot of those people That's early true. on who were just big names in this business um, have become many of them personal friends and you know so uh, I would include people like Donald Clark in that who you've, I know oh, there's, that another. there's another one of our connections um, you know and I recall being at Learning Technologies one year where I was I wasn't speaking that year I was chairing and Donald called me at seven o'clock in the morning he said you're doing the last ten minutes of my presentation Oh, right, OK. What's it about? <laughs> it said adaptive learning. Um, so it's a wonderful sort of p position after so many years. I, I mean, we've both been around this. You've possibly been there longer than I have. Um, uh, but, you know, we've been doing this a long time. We all know the, who, who the smart people are. Um, and certainly, yes, you do interview most of them. I do my best. And I particularly enjoyed Donald's series, actually, on learning the, the theorists. So that, that, that's one I return to quite a lot. Great minds on learning facts uh, available wherever you get your podcast from. You mentioned the network there. Lastly, what's the best place for people to follow your thoughts on activity? Which is the platform you favour most in this um, networked world? Well, uh, these days, um, probably my LinkedIn profile. I do have a website, but obviously now I'm working for a vendor. I don't write as much as I would have done previously. Um, but there's a lot of my historic blog posts on there, and from time to time I do add to it. So www.andywooler.com, fairly easy to remember, or connect via LinkedIn. Andy, thank you very much for sharing all that with us today. It's been a very interesting conversation. Thanks. It's been an absolute pleasure, John. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. That's all on the Learning Hack podcast for this time. Many thanks to our guests and all our sponsors. The Learning Hack is completely independent and transparently funded by sponsorship. If you want to help others find us, please like, follow, rate, review and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice or on YouTube. Next time, we'll be learning about the art of talking with children from speech pathologist Rebecca Rowland. And watch out for next week's groundbreaking episode of Great Minds on Learning, in which we'll be talking about the metaverse from, from the metaverse. The metaverse. Until then. Stay curious, learning people. I finally get it.